Well, hello, class. This is my first recording back after about three days of uh, rest and relaxation. <laughs> because, as you know, how much I love putting all the materials together to get these lectures ready and doing them, and then finding out that, oh my God, I, I, I didn't hit the record key again. <laughs> Plus, it's been some nice days. Nice uh, couple days, and I've caught up on a lot of things. And uh, now, what I want to do, uh, and I've also realized still how much we have. We, there's just so much, <laughs> but <clears throat> we're going to keep moving through it. And uh, it's all uh, very, you know, interesting and important uh, stuff uh, to do, both in electrostatics, which is still sort of what we're moving through, although, you know, I, I always jump forward to Maxwell's equations. I always jump backwards to uh, epsilon equals epsilon sub r times epsilon sub zero. Let's write that down. Epsilon equals epsilon sub r times epsilon sub zero. So, uh, what I want to do today is I want to do an example, really talk about multi-layered capacitors uh, and how this would change. And maybe give you guys some idea uh, uh, about this. So, so let's talk, uh, we're, we're gonna talk about capacitance and capacitors um, for a uh, couple lectures. Uh, we've already talked about it for one lecture uh, where I derived a lot of equations about, um, you know, energy per unit volume, uh, comparison of energy per unit volume, looking at that. What I really want to do is uh, really, uh, electrostatics can be totally incredibly boring. <laughs> or if you look at the applications of it to what you're going to probably be doing, or, or things that are going to come across your desk or whatever in your whole career, your 40 years as an engineer, uh, capacitance and capacitors are really the manifestation of electric fields, right? Of static, planar electric fields. And so it's, it, it's interesting to understand really what's going on there and everything else. And I talked about that conceptually. Now I want to talk about it, you know, uh, uh, equation wise and, uh, you know, uh, uh, look at a multi-layered um, capacitor. And I think that's probably the best way to get into it so that you can see uh, what we're doing here. And the reason that I'm working with a multi-layer uh, capacitor, a three-layer, yeah, three-layer capacitor, a serial capacitor, all right? So what we have here is we have three layers um, and uh, uh, we've got, I'm going to just make this, I mean, it doesn't really matter what voltage I make it, right? But let's just make it uh, 10 volts across, am I recording? <laughs> 10 volts across that. And like I say, we've got three different layers and each with a different relative permittivity. All right, so that's what I'm going to say. The relative permittivity of the first layer is 2. The relative permittivity of the second layer is 6. And the relative permittivity of the third layer is also 2. So it could go this way, it could go that way, whatever. It's 6 in the middle. Uh, we also have a voltage differential across each of these three different dielectrics that we have sandwiched together here, right? So uh, the, I'm gonna put a couple, well, well, we'll talk about that later, but let's just look at the voltage first. So we're gonna have, we've got, we've got basically 10 volts here, right? And we've got zero volts here. Well, how does the voltage then change as it goes across these three dielectrics uh, trapped between these two copper plates, right? How does it go? Well, I've got a voltage differential, right, across that first one. 
I've got a voltage differential across the second one, and I've got a voltage differential across that third one. I'll call that uh, one, two, three, right? And then we also have the flux, right? Because the flux through here, through these three things is, is, uh, is got to be the same, right? So, so the, the flux, and, and I'm saying that they're all the same cross-sectional area. So let me see if I can sort of draw this in three dimensions now. Right, so they all have the same uh, cross-sectional, let's just shoot those back there, the same cross-sectional area as it goes through here. So by cross-sectional area, I mean this area right here, right? The plate area is the cross-sectional area that I'm talking about. So A1 equals A2 equals A3. So the same cross-sectional area. And also the flux that is flowing through there. And wouldn't you know, I've now lost my red pen. <laughs> the only pen that ever helped me is gone, but I guess I can use the blue one. So, right, the flux that's going through all of those is D. So I also know that D1 equals D2 equals D3. Now, does that mean that E1 equals E2 equals E3? No, of course it doesn't because <laughs> remember what D is, but what it does mean is that epsilon one, epsilon, uh, I'll just say epsilon one for right now, times D1 equals epsilon two, times D2 equals epsilon three times D3. See what I, see what I mean? And I really should uh, probably be drawing those as uh, vectors and magnitudes and, you know, but I'm just using the fact that I don't put a, uh, a, an arrow or a magnitude sign around it, the fact that I'm just talking about the magnitude of the flux, all right? So <laughs> there's the flux, that's the direction it's going. And it's fluxing through those three different areas, right? One, two, and three. So, so we know a couple things about this because we know what these are. Now, really what I'm saying here, and I'm gonna write this out, just I hate to do it, but I'm gonna do it anyway. When I say epsilon one, I really mean epsilon R one. Oh, I should put them here, one, two, three, right? Epsilon R1 times epsilon sub zero times uh, D. <laughs> this, see, I just start and already I make, where is it? Where is it? Just a second. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> well, I should have known that Murphy's Law says like one minute into the, the lectures again, something would happen. Um, no, it is not <laughs> epsilon D. D does not equal epsilon D. How could that be? It equals epsilon E. So that's what I wrote down there. Yeah, D1 equals D2 equals D3. And of course, D equals epsilon E. So um, that's what uh, I meant to say. And uh, so I've got epsilon E1 times epsilon E2 times epsilon E3. And then when I was starting, what I was starting to write down was that this is epsilon R1 times epsilon zero times, <laughs> eps times E1 equals epsilon R2 times epsilon sub zero times E2 equals epsilon r3 times epsilon sub zero e3. And I wanted to write all of that out for you so that I could show you that yes, in this uh, thing, yes, uh, all of them have epsilon sub zero, so it cancels out. And so that's why 
we don't necessarily, in this particular instance, have to worry about epsilon sub zero in the relationship between the three electric fields, and that's what we're really looking at, isn't it? So what we really have here is we have two times, epsilon, times E1 equals six times E2 equals two times E1. Does everyone see that? See the relationship? Uh, just a little algebra I, I did there. In fact, uh, we really can say that uh, E1 equals three E2 equals E1 right, <laughs> equals E3, right. So that's our relationship that we're really looking at is that the magnitude of E1 equals three times the magnitude of E2 equals E3, right? So we could, we can use that uh, if we have a substitutional algebra with another, you know, equation that we might have. Oh, hey, talk about another equation that we might have. Look at the voltages, right? Look at those voltages. We know that the voltages have to sum up to 10 volts, don't we? So we know V1 plus V2 plus V3 have to equal 10 volts. And we also know what voltage equals because uh, if uh, electric fields are volts per meter, volts per distance, then wouldn't voltage be equal to the electric field times distance? Boy, I don't want to use that dot there, do I? Because uh, you might think it's a dot product. Uh, voltage is E times D, right? So what I could say, now, oh, I, you know what I forgot to write in here? As you can see, all of those are equal, so it wouldn't really matter what I put there. I could put a meter, I could put uh, 10 centimeters or whatever it is, because uh, I've drawn them all equal. But I just want to uh, point out, in this, in this case here, I'm saying that they're all one millimeter. The distances between this, you know, just being realistic, we could talk about what the electric fields are in there too. Once we figure out what the electric fields are, uh, we could talk about what those are and if those would be greater uh, than the electric breakdown strength, the dielectric breakdown strength for any of these three particular dielectrics that I've got here, but uh, I'm sure they're not going to be, right? This is relatively thick, one millimeter. So what we've got here when we look at it is, uh, but I've just put them there so that, you know, for, so, so is, is we've got the electric fields then, don't we? So we've got E1, times one millimeter, zero, zero, one meters, right? Plus E2 times 0 0.001 meters plus E3 times 0 0.001 meters. And you might say, well, why don't you just take that 0 0.001 meters out of there in the beginning uh, is because I didn't want to lose anybody, you know, because I'm really saying uh, my electric field strength times the thickness. Electric field strength times the thickness, that's what the voltage equals across each one of those, right? And we know uh, that that equals 10 volts. So let's take that out of there now, right? Let's take that out of there now I don't even know, do, I, I'm sure I don't even have to do this step, but if I take that common uh, multiplicand out of there right now, then that's one one thousandth. If I bring it into the denominator over here on this side, that's 10 volts divided by one one thousandth, which would really make 10,000, uh, I'm gonna do that, 10,000 volts, per meter, right, equals E1 plus E2 plus E3. Does everybody see that? Oh boy, well, <laughs> I guess you don't if, oh, there you go. Okay, because uh, maybe because I was writing. All right, so yeah, v, V1 plus V2 plus V3, and all I did was I just took the uh, common, 
uh, 0 0.001 meter out of there, brought it underneath the 10. So I made uh, 10 volts divided by one one thousandth of a meter, which really gives me 10,000 volts per meter. And then that's just uh, what's left over E1 plus E2 plus E3. Now, uh, that gives us another thing, but I can substitute in this, can't I? Because I know that E1 is three times E2, isn't it? And I know that E3 is three times E2. So I really have, let me write it out here. I have three E2 plus E2 plus three E2, right? Equals 49. <laughs> no, seven E2. So let's do that. So we know that seven times E2 equals, I probably know before I set, set this up, maybe should have checked the, well, you know, I, I, I can't see. Every time I go back, it hasn't changed. So, uh, you know, maybe I've got the, I don't have the curtains pulled down enough or something, I don't know. Let's, let's, oops. there you go. And uh, maybe that's a little better, <laughs> I have no idea. So seven times E2, it's a little better for me, I, uh, um, is 10,000 volts per meter, right? Does everyone see that? Um, so if I want to find E2, obviously, E2, or the magnitude of E2. Uh, we know the direction of E2 anyway, it's all, it's all down. So uh, the magnitude of E2 is going to be uh, 10,000 volts per meter divided by seven, which gives me 1.414, God, that number, boy, does it pop up a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> well, of course it does. Uh, volts per meter. So um, 1,414 volts per meter, that's E2. So we know what E2 is now. Uh, and what is E1? and E3, right? Those would be three times E2, and those equal 4.28 times 10 to the three volts per meter. See, so both of those are relatively very low, and that's why I made it 10 volts, not 100 volts or 1,000 volts or whatever, because then we'd be getting into some breakdown strength. So these are, these are relatively, uh, this is just to do the problem, not to really look at um, a series-based uh, you know, capacitor design, which is something that I want to look at uh, in, in the same type of problem. I want you to sort of, uh, you know, just sort of follow me through this and see how the various different things would change. Uh, you know, uh, if we use different materials or if we had, I shouldn't say if we use different materials, I really should say if we, if we use different materials or we had different materials and that's what today is <laughs> for, for you guys, really the materials that we're using now uh, with ultra capacitors, super capacitors, batteries, I think, as we know them, will cease to exist for your grandchildren, right? Your grandchildren won't know what a battery actually was, just like, you know, you don't know what a gravity battery is. <laughs> and, I, and I only knew what it was like when I was young and my grandfather was using one. <clears throat> But um, this also then tells us some other things too, right? So now we know what E1 and E3 and uh, E2 uh, are for the electric field. So what are the voltage drops uh, across each one of those? So my voltage drop then is going to be, let's say voltage one 
is going to be E1 times D1. So uh, E1 is uh, 4.28 times 10 to 1,000. Well, that's 1,000th. Uh, 1,000 times 1,000th, I'll do that in my head. It's 4.28 volts, right? And that equals V1. And we can do the same thing for V3. V3 equals 4.28 volts. Drop across it because it is the same. And then we also know that V2 is a 1.414 volts drop across it, right? So we've got all of our voltages. We've got all of our, uh, our I mean, our voltage drops across the three different dielectrics. We've got our electric fields in each of those three dielectrics. And I hope everybody's been following me through the, I think I gave you a, a problem on this uh, in your homework. So uh, I hope you've been following me through this with no problem. I, I, I think it's pretty all straightforward. I'm gonna use this, I want, and the reason I say that is because I'm gonna use this same pattern here to look at another problem with something similar, but then look at how by changing the various different characteristics of what we have here, how we could change uh, and use this in the design. <clears throat> okay, so the last thing that we still haven't done <laughs> is we still haven't figured out what the uh, flux is, right? I'll put it over here. So the flux, what is D1? We know D1 equals D2 equals D3, uh, but what is it? It's just uh, epsilon times uh, E, right? So we could use any of these individual ones. We could just say that it's epsilon uh, one times E one. And here's where it gets real tricky, doesn't it? Because now some of you that are watching me right now, even though I've written it up here in the corner and I've written it down here, are gonna say, well, okay, that means that he's got to multiply that by two. Right, because you see up here, epsilon sub R1 equals two. And that's what you're gonna do on the test. You're gonna multiply it by two, right? Which would be wrong because it's supposed to be multiplied by two and also by 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 farads per meter. Let's write that up there. Epsilon sub zero is 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 farads per meter. And uh, mu sub zero, Raphael? <laughs> Kidding, I'm obviously, you can't answer me because we're not in a, a meeting. And that is four pi. Now when I write, put that in, I put 12.56. I know what you're thinking, four pi, well, you know, could I put 12.5 in there, Professor Grenquist, instead of writing four and then getting the second thing and doing the pi four times pi? Can I just write 12.56? Yes, you can, because I do. I just put in 12.56 times 10 to the minus seven whenever I stick that in my calculator. And of course, that is Henry's per meter. Of course, I forgot to turn my timer on. What do you think I am? Somebody who could get everything together? Before uh, I, I actually did this, no. I, you're lucky I've only had to stop it once so far. And how would I even know how long it is anyway? I'm sure that one of you is going to tell me, oh, you know, there's a, there's a clock on the recording. No, there's not. Not that I can find. So let's get back to this. If that's D, then I've got this as... Uh, Seven point five seven times ten to the minus eight coulombs per square meter. All right. And what would that be? I'm gonna put it up here. What would that be at ten to the minus nine? Seventy-five point. Seven 
times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs per square meter, right? I know I'm going to keep doing it with you too until you get it down. All right, the last thing that we want to do is we want to find out what the capacitance is, right? What is the total capacitance of that series uh, thing that we've got there? And you can't just say, oh, well, that's just going to be uh, whatever the D is, and I'll just the A and then divide by 10 volts, right? You can't do that. You can't do that because it's a sandwich, isn't it, of three different layers. So what you have to do is you have to like take each of those uh, in series. So here's what we've got. I really shouldn't really say yeah, it, it, yeah, series. Anyway, here's what we've got. So and in most cases it'll be fine. So D1, right? times A1 divided by V1 plus D2 times A2 divided by V2 plus D3 times A3 divided by V3. Now you're saying, oh, isn't that the same as, because uh, D is the same, I could take D right out of there, right? Because D is D. D1 equals D2 equals D3, so it equals D. There's only one D. And you know what else? We've got a common um, cross-sectional area. So we can take A out of there too, can't we? So D and A are going to come uh, uh, right out of there. Oh, you know, I forgot to give you A, by the way. That equals 10 square centimeters. 10 square centimeters. <laughs> You're on 10 square centimeters. Why, why would he give it to us in square centimeters? Why, why wouldn't I? So anyway, we can take DNA out of there, but then what that leaves is it, it isn't, isn't 1 over 10, is it? No, it's not. It's 1 over 4.28 volts plus 1 over 4.28 volts plus 1 over 1.414, which doesn't come up to 1 over 10. I think everybody sees that. Uh, so what we end up getting there is a capacitance that is, uh, I think it's, uh, I think it's 88.9, but uh, I'll round it, round it to 80. Nine uh, picofarads. Eighty-nine picofarads. So that's what the capacitance is for that capacitor. In fact, we've got two things. We've got the capacitance here, right, and we also have the flux. I uh, don't know how I can do that. I'll do that. Anyway, so we also have the flux. Uh, I'll, I'll just put uh, D for your notes. Now, what I want to do is I want to look at a different uh, uh, configuration. Uh, actually, well, yeah, no. I want to look at a, a different uh, configuration. Um, what if instead of having those like that, I had a capacitor that had three levels like this? The first one was two, just like that. The last one was two, but the one in the, in the center was 15,000 relative permittivity, right? So instead now, we're gonna keep all the other parameters the same right now. I'm gonna look at the difference of them you know, later on, but we're gonna keep all the other parameters the same, 10 squares, centimeters. Oh, oh hey, you know, I, uh, I forgot to actually work this out for you, didn't I? Because of the D and the A and everything else. That's what I wanted to do. Um, let me do that. So C total, so we've got D, that comes up to um, 
Oh God, I forgot to put E1 in there. What, what, where's E1? Four. <laughs> so let's do this. Times E1, which is 4.28 times 10 to the three volts per meter, which is supposed to have been in there because this is uh, epsilon. I got too carried away with the multiplying epsilon sub r and epsilon sub zero that I forgot to put E1 in there. But these three together, believe me, add up to uh, this. 10 to the minus eight coulombs per square meter or 75.7 times 10 to the minus nine coulombs per meter, all right? So that's all right. But then when we come back down to this and we want D, so that's still going to give me the 7.57 times 10 to the minus eight coulombs per square meter, right? Um, and then times A. Now I've got 10 square centimeters, don't I? How do I change that? How do I change? 10 square centimeters. Well, I've, I've got to have, right? When you think about it, we're taking centimeters. Well, how many centimeters? Do they go in the top or the bottom? No, I've got 100 centimeters to one meter, don't I? But I've got to square that because I'm talking in terms of square centimeters that I want to get out of there. So I've also got to, to, to square this, which is 100. So that makes it 10,000, right? Does so everyone see that? And then I multiply it by the one over 4.28 plus one over 4.28. Those are the voltage, voltage drops uh, plus one over 1.414 volts. And that's what gives me the uh, 89 picofarads for that. All right. Now, having done that, I've just about used up all of my sheet of paper, uh, but here's what I wanted to do. You know, if we look at that, then what we can really say is that uh, epsilon or, or E1 equals 7,500E2 equals E3, right? That is one, that becomes one of our independent equations that we have up here, except all of a sudden three turns into 7,500. Do we have material like that? Do we have material that could do that? Yes. We've had that material for a long time, but, but, but it's had such a horrible breakdown strength, we, we never could use it. What's happening now is we're getting materials that have high, high breakdown, higher breakdown strengths, but still with high permittivity. And uh, that's what we're gonna see. You know, uh, there, there are a lot of rare earths on the moon. And that's why we're going there, <laughs> in addition to so many other good reasons. Now, so we've got that. And then let's look at the actual um, voltage uh, across here, right? If we just kept it the same uh, as we did, uh, then what we really could say is if we uh, uh, looked at those, those you know, um, Yes, now wait a second, E1, da, 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 da. and that would be 7502, wouldn't it? So what that tells me is that E2 is going to equal 10,000 volts per meter. I think everybody's following me here. Or no, no, you're asleep. That's right. 10,000 volts per meter. Uh, divided by 7,502, right? And what that gives us is, um, oh God, I didn't, I didn't write it down here. Oh, 0.666.2. Six, six, six volts per meter. <laughs> That's right, 0. 0.666 
uh, volts per meter. So E1 and E3, I actually did not write those down, uh, but I can. So E1 then uh, is going to be equal to 7,500. Wait, wait a second. No, 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 no. I've got that wrong. I've got this wrong. Um, or I may, I'm, I'm sure I've got it wrong, but I've got to, and then there you go. I can't find my, uh, or there we go. So I've got my eraser pad here. So if it was three, then it turns into seven. And so this is really 15,001, excuse me. I, uh, I actually, I, I actually get the answers right. I forget to write them because I don't do these intermediate steps. I'm just doing them, you know, uh, on the calculator. 10,000 volts per meter divided by 15,001. That's what I meant to say. That's right there. This is the, the, same, the perfect combination. But when I, we work it into here, 7,500 plus 7,500 plus one gives me 15,001. And that's why it comes out to... 0.666, uh, actually seven would actually be the real number probably because, or no, it's 0.666, right. So E1 uh, then is going to be, uh, and E3 is going to be 7,500 times 0.666 volts per meter. And that's got to give me like, 4,999.15 volts per meter equals E3. So there you go. That's, uh, that's what it is. And you can also see what the volts are two and uh because i've kept everything everything the same so my voltage is there my voltage drop across one is going to be 4.99915 my voltage drop across two or three is going to be 4.99915 and my voltage drop across two is going to be 0.666 volts right do you see do you see what i've got here now what if i wanted a lot more of the voltage stored in here you know what if i wanted a lot more of the voltage stored in here i could change the thickness of this couldn't i <clears throat> because when you look at the electric field here this electric field is like nothing and it's taking up a whole uh, uh, millimeter, isn't it? So couldn't I condense that millimeter down and make that electric field uh, greater in that area? In fact, if you think about it, if I was to uh, uh, shrink this down, wouldn't that make the whole thickness of this thinner so that I could shove more energy or the same amount of energy into the, the uh, uh, into a smaller uh, volume. Does everyone see that? Right? So uh, that's what uh, I, I wanted to point out there, that I, 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 we could actually take this here, this 0.66 volts per meter, and uh, shrink that down so that that electric field is higher, sort of like this, or balance this out, and then we can, we can uh, it doesn't have to be just three layers either. What if I had a thousand layers? What if I had a thousand layers that was stepping up from the lower side with high breakdown stuff, but low permittivity up to super high permittivity, but with very low, low breakdown strength, but in very thin, thin, thin sandwiches in the middle and then going uh, out on the other side, you know, that, uh, would be an interesting little capacitor, super ultra capacitor, wouldn't it? So anyway, I just wanted to point this out and show you how you can change the design of the capacitor and you can get uh, you know more stuff through there. 
uh, will we still have the same, like this would be one over five, this would be one half plus one half, which is one. <laughs> so this would really be, you know, turning this more into a capacitor that's just two and anyway. But you can see how the thickness of the capacitor, you know, all of that. Now I haven't gone into what the volume and we haven't gone into the breakdown strength or whatever. That's not exactly what this course is, is about. Um, this is a great you know, thing to sort of get into and just sort of look at how electric fields and how capacitors, which are electric fields, uh, really uh, operate, right? Okay, well, I'm gonna hold it there. I've got, uh, let's see. You know, I've got a fantastic um, example on capacitive um, energy. And so I wanna, the next lecture is gonna be on capacitive energy. How do we store energy in a capacitor? And as a matter of fact, I, uh, I, I thought about a capacitor example that I did for you guys, and I forgot to talk about, I think, the energy um, contained in that, those capacitors, the mica, and the, uh, uh, as far as the energy per unit volume went for those two, and I might, I might bring that up. All right, I uh, don't have any more room on the paper really, so <laughs> I'll let you go and I'll see you at the next uh, lecture.